Ale, ale, This week, I'm very grateful and go and show Father Wendell's talk at the conference. Last uh, a couple of days ago, we listened to him. Kathy and Diane Freebie grabbed him and gave a beautiful little testimony that we aired a couple of days ago. There's last Thursday. <clears throat> but now we'll go ahead and air his talk at the conference. Um, In 2008. 2008. And he shares a couple of the same things, but a lot of new stuff. He talks about uh, coming to the end of his tether and telling the Lord, I know you want me to be a priest, but I can't do it anymore. I can't go through this anymore. There's no greater apocalyptic thing that I think than, well, for instance, within the, what has come against the priesthood in the church in this country. Um, even Our Lady in her June 2nd, 2012 message, when she tells us, and read that message, I was going to do it here, but it'll take too much time. <laughs> Since when has that bothered me in the past? Um, that we're the predestinate called, as the Holy Spirit and Jesus called her, and now she's calling us. And it's just incredible. And she tell, says, great is the responsibility upon you. And she tells us, Though, if receiving my son in the Eucharist is the center of your life, then do not be, be afraid. You can do everything. I am with you. Mm -hmm. Well, even the predestinate that St. Louis de Montfort prophesied, without the Eucharist, they can't do anything. Without the church, they can't do anything. I am with you every day. And then she ends that June 2nd, 2012 message. I am with you. Every day I pray for the shepherds and I expect the same of you. Because my children, without their guidance and strengthening, through their blessing, you cannot do it. The predestinate can't do their job. Without the Eucharist, without the blessing of priests. October 2nd, she, she t ends that message telling us, Again, I call you and implore you to pray for those whom my son has called. November 2nd, she ends her message, pray for the shepherds because none of this would be possible without them. And December 2nd, she called, she ended her message, pray also for those whom my son has chosen and consecrated. She's been continuously in the last couple of years been telling us to pray for the priests, pray for shepherds. You know, if the devil wants to come against the church, that's where he's going to come against, the shepherds, the priests. And to understand the significance of Father Wendell's testimony, how God went in and, and he's doing it all over the place. I remember Don Calloway had said in his talk at Notre Dame, the bum you see on the street 
today will be the pastor and you could be the pastor in your parish tomorrow purely by the grace of God going out into the highways and byways and choosing these men who because uh, they know they're like St. Peter who responded to the Lord leave me Lord I'm a sinful man they just hold on to Jesus they're so grateful for the mercy they've been shown and they become great shepherds for the church so knowing the history of what we've been through in this country and in the church worldwide it, it increases my gratitude and my awe at what is happening today through Father Wendell the God reaching out and getting these incredible priests who uh, were not the mainstream faith you, it, it's purely an act of God doing it yeah. bringing in these yeah. priests Father Rick Wendell, this is a beautiful <clears throat> testimony of his conversion and being called to the priesthood. Earlier this day, things come together in such a different way. So instead of starting at the beginning, I'm going to start kind of at the end. There was a number of the people who were on the Bosnian trip, the trip to Medjugorje, in which we had this horrific bus accident, and, and Andy um, was, gave such a beautiful talk this morning. So there's a number of us up here taking a picture together, um, those who had come to be here. And, and yesterday, uh, Mary Suek of Medjugorje Magazine said, what are you going to talk about? You know, there's like so many stories and so many things to say. I said, well, I guess I'm going to ask God what he wants me to say. And then a friend of mine, Dr. Kimmy, says, you mean like you always do? And I'm like, yeah. Um, but as I did that, there was a motioning. There was a woman standing down over here. I didn't recognize her, and I came down and kind of, what can I do for you? The day before while sitting and talking to Mary Sue up at, the, up at the desk, there was somebody who came up and said, do you remember Father Ken Roberts, this priest that had wrote Playboy to priest and was just, yeah, he was just such a great priest. And he is a priest forever. And he had such a dynamic ministry, you know. He, he just, he could just deliver. And the camera loved him. And, and he just had this great ministry. And I, and I stayed with him one time for three days, and, and I believe I know his heart. We well, he used to do these altar calls for vocations, right? And, and I just happened in 1993, right, 15 years ago, I had come to this conference to film it and to understand it, because it, it was one of the biggest conferences, and, you know, it's been going on for 20 years, right? So you try and go and learn from the pros. So I and a group of people who eventually put on a Marian conference later that fall, in October of 93, in St. Paul, Minnesota, that drew almost 10,000 people. But I was up in the press box up there, looking down, and Father Ken does this altar call for vocations. Now, I'll come back to the story where, you know, the Lord called me strongly, but I'm kind of a thick-headed, stiff-necked, you know, slow-to-respond person. Anybody else like that? <laughs> well, I was up there, and he does this altar call, and he says, there's six men who are called to the priesthood, and I want you to come forward. I got all the way down to the, to the stairs down here at the bottom, and the sixth guy came up. So I knelt down. And this woman next to me says, uh, so why didn't you go up there? I said, well, you know, he called out six, and I didn't want, you know, to be seven. And, you know, God knows anyway. She goes, I'm going to give you something, and I don't want you to even say anything. Just pray. She reached into her bag and pulled out a priest collar, both the black and the white, and hands it to me. After Father Ken got done doing his prayer and she says to me, she says, you know, this is the collar of a priest friend of mine. I came to pray for him. He's dying of cancer. And I think he's suffering for his replacement. 
So yesterday, I'm talking to Mary Sue and, and to the other people who were standing there, and I tell this story. And today, she was standing right down here. Her name is Joan. Are you even in here to stand up? She's right over there. Thank you. Is it on? Okay. Thank you. It's just a little easier for me to move around. You know, it's just one of the signs that God gave me. Just one. Now that's a pretty powerful sign, right? You'd think like, you know, maybe a guy might respond quickly to that. Well, not me. You know, it seems like I need a whole ton of signs. And I've often said that, you know, God needed to level, you know, Louisville slugger backwards across my forehead to get my attention. I'm just slow. But I think this too, now... 15 years after that event and 18 after God first knocked me off my horse is that when I get it I stick with it you see I was like he said you know God gave me a lot of gifts a lot of talent a lot of ability and I squandered it I really did I mean I didn't do the best I could do at everything I was an easy student. I mean, I was a lazy student. I didn't need to read the book. I could just go and take the test and ace it. I, I, it just, I, if I hand in a first draft, it gets an angular grade. So I, so I never really worked that hard. It, it sort of just came easy for me. And because of it, I was this arrogant little son of a gun. And my dad, didn't know how to handle somebody like me. My dad, you know, he's a cubicle guy. My brothers are like that. There's nothing, everyone needs cubicle people. I just want the corner office, you know. I want to own the company. And, and I had this ego, unfortunately, that was so swollen that no one else fit in the room with me. A couple things have happened to me in the last few weeks even a month. Here I am, a guy that I don't appreciate that other people even care for me when I'm in high school. So I went to like five proms my senior year with different girls. So three weeks ago, I get a telephone call. Mary Beth Madeline, remember me? Oh yeah. I went to your prom, you went to my prom, and we both were at a different prom with different dates, right? And she says, I was, you know, I was getting prompted about Medjugorje. Didn't know anything about it, so I went and got online, and up pops your name, right? The last guy anybody ever thought would have talked about God. Last Sunday, the reunion group from my high school who has never been able to find me after five year reunion. I could tell they were on a conference call. It was just last weekend, Sunday. So I called them back. They're all giggling. Donna Whitaker, the class president, cheerleader, right? Sat in front of me, was always tired because she was too stressed out. And so in geometry, homeroom, I fed her every answer. You know, there was Terry Kirst who trapped me under some mistletoe at one point. There was, there were, and they were sitting there laughing. I, 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 are, you, are you really the same Rick Wendell that was, that was at Hill Murray High School? And I'm like, yeah, I'm the last guy I ever thought would be a priest. Well, no, not really, Father, as they're laughing, right? <laughs> but we'd love to have you come and do the Mass at our 30th reunion. None, I nor anyone ever thought that I would be a priest. And I can tell you quite clearly for myself, I didn't have a vocation. I always thought I'd be married. And I went through, you know, high school and, and then college, being influenced by the world that when I looked, what I understand now, to be for truth, 
They would say, well, it's whatever you think it is. You know, you'll work it out. You know, it's, it's, it's all relative. Well, in a Catholic high school, I wish somebody would have told me, really, Jesus is the way, and he's the truth. And it's through him you get life. I went to a Catholic college, and, and none of the monks were going to prayer. In fact, they made me the resident assistant on, on two floors of the dormitory, which is like, you know, the fox guarding the hen house. You know, I mean, because at that time, literally, if you could close the door of your dorm room with a keg inside, that was considered a private party. No kidding. You know, so, so this was not an environment, even at a Catholic college, that promoted faith at all. You know, and we'll try some substantial bread, and, you know, we'll all hold hands and sing Kumbaya or what. That's not what I was looking for. And when a faculty resident approached me inappropriately, and it wasn't that that hadn't happened, you know, been approached by men or women throughout my life. It wasn't that, that it was just that it happened through a priest. And I just went, I'm out of here. I, I'm done with this. And so I went to the best powder skiing available. Little Cottonwood Canyon, Utah. It's where Snowbird, right, and Alta are. It snows a minimum of 450 inches of snow a year. This year in Milwaukee, we had 100, and it was all-time record. No, this is 450 minimum. When I was there, it was like 680, 720, I mean, like 68 feet of snow. Like, you walk across, literally, the parking lot with goggles on because it's snowing that hard. And we called it the steep and the deep, and if you couldn't ski down it, you jump off it. We did, we did extreme skiing before there was a word for it. And I lived a life that the world wants to hold up as somehow being exemplary. It was full of drugs and promiscuous sex, um, great rock and roll concerts, a lot of things that we thought were fun. But I got to the point in my life where I hated hearing the birds sing. Because I had been up too long and the partying wasn't fun anymore and I wasn't going to go to sleep anytime soon. That's not a good place to be. The loneliness, the separation from my family, the, 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 the superficial relationships that all went on there. And I can remember little glimpses of things like going up on, on Alta on, on the first run of the day, trackless snow. And you know how sometimes snow in the sunlight looks like diamonds, a field of diamonds? And I just thought, you know, God must ski. And yet I was so far away from God. But I was in the best shape of my life. And in the shoulder seasons between being a lifeguard in the summer and skiing all winter, I found that uh, I needed some money, so I went to work building condominiums on the ski slopes at Alta. And, you know, when you're working at 8,700 feet or whatever it was, you know, and we were working 12 hours a day, seven days a week, you can get in really good shape. And they paid you well. So in the summertime, I figured I liked the money more than I would like continuing, you know, with the... Well, getting a suntan's nice at the beach, but, you know, eventually it gets old. So I started building, and, I, and by 27, I had 15 men working for me. I had a nice construction company going, and I was out all the time, right? I, I didn't eat at home. I had closets full of clothes. Who knows where they are, because I certainly wouldn't fit in them now. But, they, but I, you know, and I dated a lot, And I thought I was happy. And there's some good times in that. But I, you know, I wasn't a like, my dad didn't like me. My brothers didn't like me. And I just, the world was about me and that you were all in it for me. So you were supposed to like conform to my will and because I had a strong will, that made, you know, that kind of doggy dog, you know, you're the, 
you're the supreme alpha dog, so you just, you know, either the other dogs comply or you bite them, you know, or they get out of the way. And, and in the process, you hurt people, right? But I didn't take any of that in. That was just something, you either did it my way or you got out of my way. So one day I, I walked into this rock, you know, it was a pickup bar, and there was a, this is how big my ego had gotten. I went in, there's like a dozen girls sitting at a table. I pick out the prettiest one, and I go, I'm going to date her. And I roll up the table, and I'm like, I got this huge ego, and I'm like, you're going to date me? And she hands me her card. I eventually get engaged to this girl. So I'm going to go, if you're going to go, go large, right? So I do this huge engagement thing, and then I, I go down and I register at the cathedral, right? Because you have to do that six months in advance so you can have your wedding there because it's all about the wedding day, right? Then they make you go through engaged, right? You have to go through marriage preparation. So I jumped every hoop, did whatever I needed to to have the big cathedral wedding. But God had a different plan. One day I got hit in the face with a landscaping spike, essentially a big nail. Just caused a cut, needed to go to the hospital to get some stitches. I, when I went to the hospital, right, I had a reaction and it stopped my heart, stopped my breathing. And I was clinically dead for a couple hours where they couldn't get my heart started and they couldn't get me breathing on my own. None of my family's going to church. My parents are going through a divorce. My brother's in response to the divorce. One went to the Air Force to Germany and the other one went to Louisiana with his girlfriend. None of us were going to church. My mom begs for my life, right? Lord, I need him. But if you give him back to me, give him back to me whole or don't give him to me at all. See, my blood pH which indicates your oxygenation of your blood, had dropped to below 6.4, which is acidosis. It's inconsistent with life. I'm supposed to be brain dead, and I have a donor card on file. So they're going to harvest my organs. I'm AB positive blood, less than 3% of the population, very valuable in parts. Okay? <laughs> and and they, they do. They use everything, right? So into this, my mother prays. And I know that there was grace there. Because all of a sudden, with eyes not reactive to light, unresponsive to pain stimuli, my eyes opened, my arm wrapped around my mother, and it shocked the doctors. And by the time my family caught up with me at the hospital 22 miles away, I was sitting up in the ICU and talking. Now, there's lots of things you can talk about. But the thing was is that God let me know clearly that he exists. Clearly. I don't believe in God. I know there's God. Now the rest of it isn't all revealed. right? We have to walk out the rest of our life. Even Paul, right? Saul gets knocked on the road. Paul has to walk his way out of it. He has to be able to go... When his eyes are got scales on him, he doesn't understand yet, and he has to submit to somebody who knows Jesus. And then, even in that call, he submitted to the apostles in Jerusalem, right? I didn't know submit real easy. That's not an easy word for me, okay? You know, I don't know surrender real easy. So God takes me on a journey. Within nine months, I'm in Medjugorje, okay? There's lots of stories that get me there. It was all paid for. There's, there, you, you may have read it. It's, it's, it's on the internet. You can, you can find it. But for here, for us today, to concentrate on a couple elements of it. When I got to Medjugorje, I didn't go with a group. I had read a couple of books. I didn't really know the story all that well. When I got to Medjugorje, I went to Cross Mountain, okay? It was noon on the first day. We'd gotten off the ferry, drove up. These people drove me there. We got to Cross Mountain. My mother, who had had a heart attack at 58 and was now 
two could only make it about the fourth station. She didn't tell me how bad she was feeling, but she stopped there. I went the rest of the way, and I got up on the top of Krizovac, and the Lord kind of shows me that, you know, he set up this very simple plan for us to live, you know, how to rise and worship him in the morning. And then the men would go off to the, and work, and they would find worth in that. And the women would teach the children how to love and be the first teachers, and that they would come back together at night and that they would praise God. And that what the world was doing to God's continual lavishing love on us was being indifferent, like a cold wind coming up from the valley. So I come down off of Krizovac. My mother, at this time, this is 1991, is sitting in the only building that's there, and she's drinking a Budvar, you know, the whatever, the original country Budweiser. And she's sitting there, and, and I'm, I'm going... Uh, she says to me, she says, so how did you get down? Did you take the trail or the stairs? And I said, well, I've only been up here once, but I didn't notice any stairs. And the people with us going like, what stairs? She says, well, I didn't want to tell you how bad it was for me. So I prayed and I asked God to help me down and he showed me the stairs. So I took the stairs down. <laughs> and the people with me are like, there aren't any stairs here. So we go over to Padrado, and there's this girl on her knees retching. She's like a high school girl in dry heaps, and they're pouring, you know, a two-liter bottle of water over her head. You know how they, everyone goes and takes the water, and they get it blessed? And they're pouring this water over her head, and I don't know what's going on, and I have this interior urge. You should go pray with her. And I'm like, pray with her? I don't even go to mass regular. What are you talking about? You know, and I just sat there and watched it, and then all of a sudden she'd come out of the fit and pray, like begging God at the foot of the crucifix. And then go back in this fit again. Later on in life, there's a demonic problem there, okay? Because people today want to say, oh no, there's no devil. Yes, there is. Right? So I go, that's a, the first couple hours there. We go down to the church, and it's, it's right before they start praying a rosary. It's right before the mass starts. So they start praying a rosary, and I go to try and get in the church. Now, it's lightened up a little bit, but when I went there, you couldn't get into the church. It was like a rock concert, remember? I mean, you couldn't get in the doors. or put, I mean, you couldn't be rude and get in. It was that packed with people. So I went, and I sat on the sunny side of the church, you know, just to get some solar, because it was, at that point, it was May. And as I'm sitting there, and the rosary's coming out in a hundred different languages, I'm going... This little place, this little nothing of a village in a communist country has touched people all over the world. I, the universal church, you know, there was people in robes and, and, and people from all over the world. There, there were, you know, because you can tell the difference between Koreans and Chinese. You really can. And, and you can tell the difference between people because, you know, Americans wear tennis shoes everywhere, right? Italians, on the other hand, will climb mountains in loafers. And the Irish, that's really obvious, okay? So all these people were there, and I got the universal church, and then this little bell system played the Ave Maria. So I'm figuring they're letting us know these apparitions are occurring. And I'm just kind of sitting there watching, and everything gets really quiet. And I'm paying attention to it. And then the birds stop chirping. And it was really quiet. And I was like, wow. And then these people, not everyone, but a good portion of them, all of a sudden they're looking up at the sun. Now I'd heard about this, right? And you hear about this at, at Fatima. But I didn't ever expect to see anything. And I looked up, fully expecting to have to turn away. And I went, wow, that doesn't even bother my eyes. And I'm looking at it, and I'm looking away, trying to find the optic fatigue, you know. I'm testing it. It must be a meteorological effect, you know, except there's not enough clouds for that. You know, it's not hazy off the horizon. The sun's up. It just might be a miracle. And I'm standing, looking at it, and, and I wanted to share it with my mother, but she wasn't there. So I was talking to this woman next to me. I said, what do you see? 
And, and uh, everything was the same except this. Guys have like two words for purple, light and dark. Women have, you know, magenta and this and that. And, you know, so she's describing it. But we were essentially describing the same thing. And not everybody was looking at this, but I wanted to go share it with my mom. So I went where the rotunda wasn't even there yet or anything. But I went around the back of the church where inside the tabernacle was, but I didn't know that because I'd never been in there. And I had another mystical experience. And in this one, I was taken and I was shown my life. Not the good stuff. Okay, I had shown in more than 3D. It's, it's, it's where, you know, when you're shown your, your life and you're shown your sin and the choices you made, you don't get to see just the immediate effect. You get to see the ripple effect, the things that happen. You know, the things, if you say something to someone and you score on them, and it really hurts them in their soul, you get, to, you get to see how that affects all their other relationships. That I got to experience, the first thing I did as a five-year-old kid of stealing a, a matchbox toy that my parents would have bought for me and felt how that hurt God's heart. This little innocent boy who he loved who didn't need to do this and how that hurt God and how it affects the store owner and the other people who work there and they lose trust. But there was many, many, many far worse things than that. Far, far worse. You know, you get John up here and he talks about it. You get Father Mike and get up here and talk about it. I'm serious. I've went to all 10 heinous. This is not a pretty picture. The person you see in front of you is not the person that was there. I was not a good man. I was a sinner of the worst caliber. And people got very hurt because of me. And I led a lot of people the wrong way. Into this experience, right, I'm crying my eyes out, going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't know. And every time, it was like, you made a choice. And the experience was my whole life. I don't know how long it was, so that when I came out of this experience, I'm finding I'm on my knees, I'm looking up at this miracle of the sun. My eyes, right, I've got tears all the way down my chest. They're on that flagstones that were there. And I don't, you know, I don't cry very well because, you know, I don't practice a lot. <laughs> so I got like snot in my beard and stuff. It's not, it's really not nice. And uh, so I'm trying to, you know, get it all. And I see that my mother is now sitting on a bench about 10 feet from me, and I just went up and I put my arms around her because we're sitting there looking at the most powerful energy source known to man. And God can manipulate it at his will. God is not bound by the laws he made. We're sitting there looking at a miracle. In fact, I got to evangelize an eye doctor at Mayo Clinic because of it. I said, how are my eyes? Oh, they're pretty good. I said, is there any problem with the retinas? No. I said, what would happen if I told you I've stared at the sun for hours at a time? He says, I don't know. Well, let me tell you about this place called Medjugorje. It works. It works really good. Because we all need certain evidence. But this was the kind of stuff that I, years later, I found out that my sorrow for my sins has a name. It's not the sour out of fear of death. It's the sorrow of offending God and hurting his people. They call it perfect contrition. I didn't know that. No one had ever taught me that. What happened to me, though, is I wanted to go to confession like really, really bad and right away. Next morning, I meet this Irish priest, 
late vocation, like me, had spent time in Knock, Ireland. His name is Mike Canary. Someday I'll find the guy again. I'm sitting there with my long hair, my Zubas. Remember Zubas? Zubas are those things that the World Wrestling Federation, you know, the hawk and the animal got going, and then the NFL wore them, those really wild pajama bottoms. So I got those on, very attractive fashion statement, and long hair. And, and I met this guy, and I knew that he would be my confessor, that he would literally understand the gravity of the things that I had done. So I went, to conf I, I went to go look for confession. And you all remember how it used to be. And please God, again, you know, whoever messed it up so that you don't have confession all day everywhere in Medjugorje because it's such a crucial part of it, is that I went down. It was kind of raining out, so there wasn't really anybody outside. And I thought, didn't think that's prayer, right? And I thought, in thinking about God, thought, thinking about God, called prayer, but I didn't think of it as prayer because that always has a form, I think, you know, Lord, I really, really, really would have liked to go to confession to Father Mike. And he walks right out of my peripheral vision, just right there, with an umbrella. <laughs> he sits down and he hears hours worth of, of confession. And the thing was, he had the script. He had those gifts of the confession. I get to the really difficult parts for all of us, right? There are those things that we have said and done that are so humiliating, we don't even want to go there in our mind, right? And he would he'd say, this is what you were doing, but this is what you were thinking for hours. When he laid his hands on my head for absolution, this heat came out of his hands and it went into me. I didn't know what it was. I just knew that it was. Then... He gave me non-standard penance. I'd tried to go to confession before, you know, like Father Mike was talking about, and the priest would go, say five Hail Marys. Again, that's not the priest, it's not a problem with the priest, it just didn't seem enough for what I, five Hail Marys, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, the first bad thought I've had, maybe, but not everything afterwards, right? And so I, I, he says, I want you to go to Krizovac. I want you to take off your shoes and it's not a penance. That's just going to equalize you to the people who come here who are older, infirm, incapable of doing it. You're young and strong. It says, you take off your shoes. And then you are to pray for every person you have ever hurt. The next morning, I got up. I walked across the fields. And there's, it was really early at dawn because I don't want anybody to see what I'm doing. Right? Never thought I'd be up here with a mic did not want anybody to see what I was doing. I'm like looking for the stray dogs for company. It was, you know, I was really kind of dreading it. I get to Krizovac, I take off my shoes, and I leave them at the bottom. Now, if you look around, most people wear their shoes back up to the top. Coming down's a lot more difficult because you can't control where your foot goes. And I have these little size eight feet for my size. God knows how to do things with drama. The thing was, is when I went up and I started praying, I could remember their names. I could remember the lies, the seductions, the bad business deals. All the things that I had done, I could remember the people's names. And I sobbed all the way up. You know how people are. They're, oh, you know, they want to, when they see you, Eventually on the hill, you know, like they don't know what's going on with you. But they're like, there was no comfort in that because I knew the gravity of what I had done. All the way up and all the way down. At that, there was a crucifix at the bottom, right? I threw myself at the foot of the cross and I begged for my life. Because I knew that I could do it perfect. And I would never make up for it. There were people who died because of me. And I could never, ever make it up. And there were things I did to people that would have been nicer. But somehow I knew, I really felt forgiven. Really. A 
put my shoes on, thank God for Nike, and I walk down to the church, right? And I get down there and I run into this Father Mike Canari. And he goes, come with me. And he took me into one of those classrooms and there were 20 people there that I didn't really know, right? And folding chairs and they were praying, you know, the never-ending amen song and some other things. Some things I knew, some I didn't. But nothing happened to anybody else. He called it a healing service. He pulls out the little mini stole, right? Puts it on, the traveling purple stole. And people would go up to him, talk to him a little bit, and go sit down. Nothing happened to anybody. I walk up. I'm not thinking, you know, anything. And I get about three feet away from him. And out of my mouth, involuntary, involuntarily comes, I have many scars on my heart, and what I want is the Holy Spirit. And I was like, that's pretty weird. Because I wasn't expecting to say anything, let alone that. And he didn't, he didn't say anything. He took some oil, right? Some blessed oil. He made the sign of the cross on my forehead. He put his hand on my head. He put his hand on my heart. And the Holy Spirit came down with power. It was so powerful that I got frightened, not in scared, but in the awesome sense, like, oh, my to me, it was like, for those who know Star Trek, right, if you ever stuck your head in the antimatter, right, a regular field of power, and it stopped above my heart, and I remember, and, and then he spoke directly to it. He goes, let there be no more doubt, let there be no more fear, and it was like the biggest breath of air I ever took, all of a sudden, right down to the bottoms of my feet, filled beyond my imagination, an ecstatic experience, really. More fun than any drug experience, by a long shot, right? This was better than any sexual experience. It was, be it was better than Christmas magnified. It was like way out there. And the more I, oh, it felt like as I opened my heart, my chest, you know, kind of figuratively, the more I opened myself, the more he filled me. The more I opened myself, the more he filled me. The more I opened myself, the more he filled me until I couldn't even make really a distinction between God and myself. It was just union. And I didn't know how long he could stay there. Again, a timeless experience. And then I kind of relaxed away from it. And as I did, I realized I'm laying on the floor that my 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 body's stiff, you know. It's so stiff. It's like like you got plugged into a bajillion volts, and then my my toes were like straight out, and I was I was so stiff. You could have like stuck me in the back of two chairs, you know, like the magician's dummy thing. I was really, really that stiff. And Father Mike was on one side with his hand on my chest. There was this Bill Curry, 18 years old, six months before, had been an absolute drunk. God had delivered him from being face down in the gutter and he was praying on the other side and into this relaxation came this warmth. I had known winning the big game, falling in love, all those kinds of things. But in my life, I had never known joy. I mean, it was sappy. Father Mike said I almost broke his back. I hugged him so hard. You know, I loved everybody. It was like, oh, it, and, and what happened was, is that I, it was May and I was walking around in a t-shirt because I was emanating heat all the time. And, and like, after I was home for two weeks, you know, I, I walk into my mother's bedroom. I go, mom, I think I'm talking in tongues. Listen to this, you know. Now, right, so I mean, and things happen, right? It says, these things follow them that believe. They will lay hands on the sick and they'll get well. It happens, right? These, you know, that God intends us to have a Trinitarian relationship, right? That it's not about a charismatic renewal. God loved that. It's about a Trinitarian relationship. Look at what happened. God showed me grace first. I didn't do nothing. I didn't turn back to God. He turned to me knocks me off my horse, and my high horse it was. Gets me laying in the road going, who are you? Then he introduces me to Jesus, his son. And then takes me to Medjugorje, and through the intercession of the mother, 
gets me filled with the Holy Spirit. Only and after true contrition for my sins, a sacramental confession. And then the grace really starts pouring. So I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. The next day is the feast of Corpus Christi, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, tomorrow. Okay? God's all about drama. Love him for that. It's the feast of Corpus Christi. In Europe, that feast is not moved to the weekend. It's celebrated during the week. The little kids have got their, their flowers out at St. James Church, right? The night before, all with their first communion outfits on, ready for tomorrow's feast of Corpus Christi and first Holy Communion, right? <laughs> so, again, at dawn, like he likes to do with me, I have this mystical experience. All of a sudden, I'm standing in this field. And there's a fence that goes down, and the field kind of falls away in both directions, and the grass is about seven to eight inches high. And you know how when the wind blows, it looks like waves? So this, if there's a breeze going, there's this waves going through the grass, and up walks Jesus. Now, I can't see his face anymore. You know? I used to be able to, but he had a brown outer robe that was more coarse, and then he had a cream-colored inner robe on. And he walks up and wordlessly, but communicating perfectly, says, I want you to be a priest. Now, you know, the choirs didn't start singing and they're, they're, heaven opened up, okay? I had never, ever thought of being a priest. Ever. Okay? And then my first response to him saying, I want you to be a priest is, I'm the greatest sinner ever. You and I have both just been through this, right? And I get back, yeah. And I said, I'm engaged to be married, right? The dress is bought, the country club is rented, I've gone through marriage preparation. I've treated this woman as my wife before she's my wife. I'd like to name my kids. Yeah. Isn't this for, for guys, you know, right, who are like, you, you choose them at conception, right? And then they walk in the beatific vision all the way to ordination. And he goes, I know what I'm doing. And he turned and walked away. And you'd think that'd be a great thing. I was crushed. Because every dream, everything that I had ever placed before myself was not priesthood. So my whole life was turned upside down. Now I got to go home and tell this gal not only that I can't sleep with her, but that I think God's calling me to be a priest. What? <laughs> that my whole life isn't set for this. And I don't know how to do it. And yet I cannot turn away from it. There's a much longer story in it. Fast forward to 19 or 2005. And I'm standing in the parking lot of St. Francis Seminary in Milwaukee. A diocese I would not have been welcome in because of my, you know, conservative views, right? Until Archbishop Timothy Dolan was named its archbishop, sent there to clean it up. The seminary was a basket case, right? One guy's girlfriend dropped him off every morning. The rector knew about it, did nothing. They taught outright heresy. It was ugly. And like the director of pastoral formation, she sat across the table from me and said, you don't have a vocation to priesthood. My response interiorly, because you dare not say anything, was you don't pray because God wouldn't have told you that. And number two, you are in the wrong job. But yet that doesn't provide the comfort, right? They tried everything they could to throw me out of the seminary. But I wasn't a morals problem, and you couldn't get me academically. But they tried everything. They wouldn't even let me take classes. And so I was working down at the marriage tribunal 
to help people later with marriage, right? Because I know what it's like to jump through the hoops. I only do one marriage for every six that my pastor does because if you're living together, you will hear about it, right, from me. I, I, don't, I, I don't care about a successful wedding day. I want a successful sacramental marriage, right? That, that marriage is difficult. All relationships are. At some point, we must choose to love, and that we need, right, strong marital relationships so that priests can have strong marital relations with the church, right? I'm married to the church. We need both vocations strongly, and people struggle at times. Fine, so that's why we do it in the community. Maybe I can help them. And for those who are unfortunate, have gone through the terrible pain of divorce, that annulment is most in the misunderstood, but now I understand it in a way that I can explain it. So I'm working at the marriage tribunal. I get this phone call from the rector's secretary. The rector wants to see you at 4.30 tomorrow. I said, I can't. I'm taking a deposition. There's not another lawyer to take the deposition. I need to go. They schedule these things six months in advance. We don't care. That's when your appointment. I'm like, I'm standing in the parking lot of St. Francis Seminary. And I think they got me, you know. They have all the power, I have nothing. I'm standing in the parking lot for the first time in my life. I said words I never thought I would say. I was a guy that bragged that if you drop me buck naked in the middle of the Sahara, I'm coming out with flocks and wives and everything, right? I said... I can't. Lord, I cannot go one more step. I can't take one more piece of bad news. I can't have anybody berate me anymore. I cannot go on. And you are the one who called me. Unless you tell me to go, you know that I cannot leave. And yet I cannot go anymore without you. You have to go before me and be my goel. Be my go-between. Be God for me. My advocate. I walked down and I went into the rector's office and he says, can I take your coat? What happened? The very first words that Archbishop Dolan said to me when I met him for the first time was, may I take your coat? A servant leader of God's people. And he said, this is my mother, invite my mother to your ordination before I ever interviewed with him. Now I know he did his background work, but here is this rector who has tried to throw me out of the seminary saying, can I take your coat? By the end of the conversation, he says, you're going to be ordained. I walked down to where my mother was living in the convent or in the sister's apartments when I told her some very good news on her 75th birthday. God is all about drama. <laughs> two weeks, two weeks before my ordination, after the priesthood retreat, the rector of the seminary sent me a registered letter, which I have, saying, I will not recommend you for orders based on nothing. So I'm thinking they got me, right? And this, this guy calls me up who is a Christian recording artist now and he, he, says, he says, so what are you going to do? He says, God called you to be a priest. Do you think any man has a say? And I was down where I needed to hear that. And in a moment of clarity, when he said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to act as a man of faith would act until the feeling of faith returns. I was ordained May 20th, two years ago, when my four classmates went off to enjoy the, uh, the reception. I stood in the cathedral that my parents were married in that I was baptized in, that I had been ordained and vested by the same priest who married my parents, baptized me at 88 years old, is still a priest working today as a divine word missionary with a big fat smile on his face, saying I'm happy to be a priest. 
I stood in that cathedral and did first blessings for hours until I was to go to my first mass. And whose face was on the front page of the diocesan newspaper come Monday? Chubby. Right? Given a blessing. I went to my first mass, right? And I gave a son of a friend his first Holy Communion. I am the sacrament of holy orders. I give him communion. All my friends are around there. We're singing God eating. I have a pig roast when I have an ordination, right? No, there's no fancy stuff. We sat down and we enjoyed the blessings of God. That fall, a woman came up to me and said, Father, you blessed me at your first mass. I said, I'm thinking, you know, I blessed a lot of people. She says, no, Father, you don't understand I had breast cancer, and then it was gone. I said, praise Jesus Christ, right? These things shall follow them that believe. It's not me, it's Jesus Christ. The next morning, I take a mass that I'm not scheduled to take. I do a baptism. I walk out of that mass. A woman asks me, would you hear the confession of my two kids? They're going down to get confirmed. I hear my first confessions. Monday morning comes. I go take the mass. The secretary comes over and says, there's someone in ICU, would you go visit them? I get the interior, don't even stop for coffee. I go over, I have, I'm slavishly attached to the book because I haven't done this before. I do the full anointing, the apostolic pardon. I said, you're in a state of grace, you can go home anytime you want. Apparently, as I turned and went out through the threshold, the woman went home. I didn't know her in life, but her daughter knew me. That was my first funeral mass three days later. When the course of about 48 hours, God had me celebrating the sacraments as if I had been a priest and now forever. And this is the grace of Almighty God that I can sit in confession just like Father Mike said with me and people coming to me 30, 40, 50 years away, people carrying loads from the Second World War and I can place my hand on their head crying with them and I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's finished. You need never confess that again. You need never carry that weight again. You have a new life in Christ. My brothers and sisters, I did nothing right. Despite all the gifts and talents he gave me. I did not bring honor to my family. I did not bring honor to God. But instead, he had mercy on me. And he taught me how to sing his praises. And for some reason, this incredible woman named Mary decided to be my patroness and has brought me into a deeper relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and helps me to grow even when I'm obstinate. So that 15 years later, God can take that sign and that priest collar and can put it on so that I can say I am obedient to Christ and I am his priest forever and I have the joy of being the one who was lost and is now found. I am the one who did not deserve mercy but received the blessing of God because I, like you, am his beloved son. My father, before he died, came to a talk I gave and he came into the back. And embarrassingly, because he didn't, I don't know how he ever found the church. He came in the back and in a booming voice he said, this is my son. This is the son whom I hated and I now love. For when I needed, he and his mother took me in. This is the son whom I hated. Listen to him. As if my very father in heaven, just like at Jesus' baptism, said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I hope 
that in the course of my life as a priest, I can bring glory and honor to God, to make God better known, to make Mary's intercession part of the life of faith of the church. This will not be easy, but I've never signed on for light duty. And so he gives me people to journey with, like big, six foot five, 400 pounds if he's a biscuit. <laughs> you know? So that we might be able to say, God truly exists. He loves you beyond your wildest imagination. And he really wants you to be happy. He wants us to be happy in life and shower us with the affection of the most holy father. So much so, he sent his only son that we might have life, life to its fullness and to be forever happy with him in the next. It's simple stuff. I had to learn it the hard way like a few of us, eh, John? But when we do, we proclaim his name. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of the Father forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Father Rick. We're so grateful for your testimony. Let's, let's give Our Lady joy and pray for these priests. There's such a beautiful springtime happening in the church today. So many, so many new vocations, so many new priests. And there are a lot of old uh, martyrs, old priests so faithful uh, to the church when it wasn't easy for them. Yeah. So let's give Our Lady joy and redouble our prayers for the shepherds, for the priests. And we'll see you again on this coming Thursday with Fruit of Nature. Oh yeah, and more, another priest, a great priest we all know. I won't tell you who it is. Mm -hmm. Don't miss it this coming Thursday. Alleluia. <laughs>